Hey folks, my name is Ravish and welcome back to another video in the series of Devil Real Time Interviews. Now, we have a profile with us today. So this person is having around 6 years of experience in IT and 3 plus years of experience in DevOps plus 5 plus years of experience in cloud related services. Okay, so the interview is mostly on AWS. So all the questions that I have asked are on AWS. And yes, I have answered all the question in this interview. Okay, so we started from AWS code deploy and then uh, code pipeline. Uh, we asked, asked about why do we have rollbacks? Then we have ECS, Ansible, uh, directory service, EKS, Fargate, a bit on GCP, but I think the person refused to answer that. And then uh, code build and the project um, and the related stuff around that. So uh, all of the interview is mostly on the AWS service. All right, so that is for the video. And if you're new over here, please do uh, subscribe to the channel because that would really support me to create more content like this. So without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so before starting the interview, if you are having issues in understanding the accent, please switch on the subtitles. All right, so let's get directly into the video. What is the total years of experience in IT? I would say um, six. Uh, six. Okay, total is six years. And how much in DevOps? Um, DevOps should be around three. three, yeah, three four, yeah. And in cloud? Um, cloud, I would say five because I've been um, working on cloud from not just, I started with Plex, um, doing something with Plex, deploying. Um, Linux servers for learning management suits written in uh, the LAMP stack, PHP, and I've done little on Azure um, for moving to AWS and working a little bit with GCP, doing BigQuery, and presently working full time on AWS. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's start. You, you are comfortable in AWS, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, let's start with the, uh, you have mentioned a lot of uh, technologies in your profile. Let's start with the first one. I can see that you have worked on Amazon uh, code deploy, right? Yes. Okay. So now consider a scenario in which your team is using Amazon code deploy for deploying applications in a microservices architecture. One of the deployments okay. failed in the production environment. How would you troubleshoot this issue? Um, um usually um i'll give a scenario of deploying to an um ecs for it. um usually when it fails it can be uh, because of the stack changes with the image it can be the image built uh, the the image that was built and the container failing to start this deployment can basically fail um, um when it's starting we're talking about scaling if uh, basically um, if your when application starts if you're if your auto scaling is not well set, set when deploying in my field because it might, it might have issues um, scaling very well. Most of the time, it's, uh, it works around you, um, your container failing to start properly. No, no. My question was like, there are multiple microservices, right? And one of the deployments failed uh, in the production environment. How would you troubleshoot this? Okay, deployment. Yeah, there is uh, basically, there is a log. For me, I'll go to the log kind of. Okay. Um, for me, I'll go to the log. There's a log for both from the um, the um, container side and also from the deployment side. Um, basically, from the build itself. Uh, but, but basically, for me, I'm going to check the logs and see why it failed because there's a log. A log there's a log group created for deployment and also there's a log created for the service, um, be it um, a fagot service or um, an ECS service or yes. Okay, so uh, I'll tell you uh, how we do it. Uh, so whenever you have to troubleshoot a failed deployment, uh, we would always start by checking the code deploy logs, which you said. Post that we would examine the deployment group and the uh, instance logs on the target instances. If there is any error, we will address them and check the application and system logs on the instances for further insight. Uh, additionally, also you can do is you can review the code deploy events in the AWS management console and CloudWatch logs if you have uh, for any relevant yeah. uh, error message. Okay, that's that's way it can be done. Okay. Can you explain me the deployment uh, rollback process in Amazon code deploy? And when and why would you initiate a rollback? Um, well, uh, rollback basically works around um, 
给我弄到头发。嗯、um, ，I can then put、um, the definition of roll back brilliantly, but usually、um, a reason for rolling back is when、uh, the deployment fails most of the time. Um, if you are creating a new、uh, definition, tax definition, basically,、um, it comes with every、uh, deployment. If that tax definition that you have, that tax you're trying to deploy feels it rolls it rolls back to、um, the former working and tax definition. Basically, that's、um, in my understanding of what happens here. Okay, I mean there were two parts to this question. First one was、uh, you have to explain me the rollback process in Amazon Code Deploy. So do you know that? Yeah, I can't remember.、Um, okay, the okay. Process, See, either you can do it manually, or there is an automatic process as well. Okay, and my second part was when and why would you initiate a rollback? Um, usually when there's a failed deployment. Mm hmm. In scenario like shown, the, when you're trying to deploy an application, and、um, there's a continuous、um, failure, container is not starting, for example. In your container, you're not starting. Basically,、um, the best place is to roll back. Why you check the logs for issues? For start from the application logs down to the、uh, deploy logs. Okay, so if there is an issue with the latest deployment, such as a high error rate or failed health checks, code deploy can automatically trigger a rollback. This is automatic process. Manually, a rollback can be initiated with issues are detected post deployment. Okay. So the system will revert to the last known good、uh, revision, ensuring minimal downtime and a quick recovery. So that's that's how it works. Okay.、Uh, do you know how to integrate Amazon Code Deploy with、uh, AWS Code Pipeline in a continuous deployment workflow? Code Pipeline.、Um, code Deploy and Code Pipeline. Yes. How you can integrate? Yes. Yes. Yes.、Um, um, pipeline. Um, Code build. Okay, it works with the code pipeline itself. There's a stage where it picks from、um, your repository. You can set up a stage、um, in your、uh, pipeline itself. Picks from your repository. You um, um, integrate it with a build, either Jenkins、uh, or use your、um, uh, your AWS build. And also the stage for deploy.、Um, you can also add、um, a stage for checking for continuous delivery, where you check for the manual approval and the rest. Okay. Okay.、Um, <clears throat> see, when you talk about AWS Code Pipeline, you can create a pipeline that includes a code deployment action, which comes from Code Deploy. This will allow you to automate the deployment process, code pipe、uh, deployment process, and、uh, Code Pipeline can be configured to monitor your source code repository, build artifacts using Code Build. Okay, and then you can deploy them on Code Deploy. So that's that's how it works. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Can you describe me a scenario where you would use AWS Code Pipeline to orchestrate the release of new feature across multiple environments? When I say multiple environments, it means development, testing, staging, production. Um. Usually, um, when you are doing um a scenario for doing an integration test. Um, yeah, that is one scenario where you use、uh, that amongst multiple、um, environments.、Um, you set up a pipeline、uh, to pick from the source branch, a build that does、uh, your integration set of integration tests, and、um, then basically do the final part of、um, deploy if those integration tests passes. See, uh, <clears throat> we'll talk about a very basic scenario. When a new feature is developed, tested, and deployed across multiple environments, like development, test, stage, prod, AWS Code Pipeline can be used to create a pipeline that automates the entire process. Okay, each stage of the pipeline can represent a different environment,、uh, ensuring a controlled and automated release process. So this、uh, uh, this is how it works. Okay, so basically,、uh, we don't need to because I'm aware of、um, because of the. Um, creating a、um, a separated or、um, in this term、um, yeah, an isolated、um, pipeline. Are you saying、um, just a push and it deploys to this environment, or、uh, an isolated pipeline created for dev and for staging for for for、uh, yeah. yeah 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 it's possible yeah you, there's a part in the settings where you can、um, 
you can integrate with your um, with your repository or your uh, version control system where you are forgotten basically where you set the the um, do a regex. Um, if it's a master, it pushes to if, it, if the master it pushes to prod, but it triggers the prod, prod pipeline. If it's let's say dev or official branch, it triggers the uh, test pipeline, dev pipeline. Yeah, I think, um, yes, I understand. Okay, um, so you have worked on Amazon ECS as well, right? Yes, okay, can you explain me how you can scale your Amazon ECS service based on increased demand during peak hours? um you you, you use the auto scaler auto scaler um using so um cloud watch events you can use the cloud watch event to, to auto scale which event um, sorry which event yeah uh, cloud watch um cloud watch events yeah um, it can be kind of scale based on um your uh we can set basically a threshold for your memory you can set a threshold for cpu and um uh, skills based on that and you can set the minimum um service uh, for each tax and the maximum during auto scaling um you can adjust the desired task count for the service uh, in amazon yeah. ecs you can do it manually or automatically using by auto scaling so basically auto scaling can be configured to scale the number of tasks based on metrics like cpu memory utilization ensuring that your application can increase uh, handle uh, handle increased demand during peak hours that yes. can be done Okay, so uh, let's say your team is migrating a monolithic application to a microservices architecture using ECS. Can you explain me how do you design the ECS cluster to support this migration? Uh, Did you get the so, question? Uh, um, yes, I get the question. The question is, um, you are yeah, migrating a monolithic application to an ECS um, the process. Basically, um, ECS does microservices. Um, it works microservice kind of. It's, it's very stupid for microservice application. Um, uh, basically, the process is to break down uh, the monolithic application into microservices, um, get them dockerized, and um, you create um, these deployments into ECS. You create a, a, a tax um, right to tax definition um, with the image. Um, for the um, monolithic application that has been micro, uh, put into a microservices uh, architectural style, um, you deploy, um, you can use an a application load balancer or network load balancer behind it if you want to talk from the part of um, scalability because application load balancer helps you scale to um, helps you control the, uh, access, security, and the rest. Then um, after that, you can now integrates um, your CICD pipeline into the play where um, where if changes are pushed into depending on your um, congregation and um, uh, policies where changes are pushed into a specific branch for example it triggers a pipeline builds and deploy to that um, ECS service changes the stacks with the latest image um, that was built and um, application is running okay I'll just a uh, bit of paraphrase it. Uh, when you, whenever you migrate a monolithic application to microservices using ECS, you can create separate task definition and services for each microservice. If there are 10, then create 10 separate task definitions and services for each microservice. You can use ECS clusters to group related services, ensuring isolation and scalability. Additionally, you can leverage ECS service discovery for seamless communication between the uh, microservices. That's, that's can be done. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What is the difference between these launch types, uh, Fargate and EC2? Um, EC2 is basically I'm managing your um, your containers. Um, for EC2, you can log into uh, there's an EC2 instance that you can see in your EC2 dashboard. Dashboard. Um, you can log into that um, and manage your your containers in that cluster. You can put them manually start. But for Fargate, um, it's, an, it's a managed service done by um, AWS. You can't log into the um, you can't log into the um, the EC2 underlying EC2 instance. Um, AWS manages uh, patches for you. Um, basically, that's around most the most differences being managed by you for EC2 instance. 
uh, ECS2 and um, Fargate yeah, is managed by AWS, especially when it comes to the patches and uh, uh, operations. Okay, okay. Um, so you have worked on Ansible as well, right? Yes. Okay, so what exactly you were doing with Ansible in your project? Oh, okay. Um, I did a little project then to join some sets of uh, Windows systems to a domain. Um, also did that for Linux, um, worked uh, in an environment where um, um, Windows um, service, Windows is being used every day because of um, the C sharp applications are written in C sharp um, and or using the ASP dot, uh, ASP core or dot net sorry framework. Um, so I used um, Ansible to basically deploy objects to server. I used Ansible to patch server. Um, I used Ansible to also manage um, DB and user creation on um, um, RDS, uh, MySQL and RDS. Um, yes, I've done little projects around them, basically uh, managing um, managing instances and uh, or servers on um, both cloud and on prem. Okay. Okay, now consider a scenario, let's say your team is managing configuration for large number of ser <clears throat> servers, okay. Explain how Ansible can help automate the configuration management process. Okay, um, for the large amount of servers, um, in this scenario, we are talking about um, them having the same OS. Um, Ansible is agentless, so you basically don't need to install any agents on those servers um, with a connection, uh, an SSS connection. Um, to a Linux um, server, for example, or Win, Win, um, RM for a Windows um, server, you can write a script, a playbook, um, do you know the jobs, you can get a role already written play, set of playbooks to um, configure those servers, be it um, installing a web server on it, um, doing some restarts, um, doing some basic configuring the servers, um, you put this set of servers, um, the IP, it can be IP or DNS, depending on how your network is being configured into the host parts of um, even uh, eventual part of your um, of your playbook. Um, you can set um, on the dot, dot slash ansible.cg, you can set uh, some set of configuration where um, you don't need to do host, host name checking because that's some, you need to disable, enable some features, disable some features in that part of um, the file, host name checking. Um, not using, um, for example, not using um, key, um, uh, let me password uh, authentication, rather you want to use, uh, let's say, PEM key in the scenario of AWS. Uh, when you put your, your those um, posts into your inventory file, you run, um, you can be, you run your Ansible, Ansible dash playbook, and um, uh, the, the name of the file, you have your, um, a set of plays needs attached to the rules and um, it, it runs against that those configuration runs against the servers and show you the steps based based, based on um, what you've configured in your playbook and they run in, they run in parallel okay okay um what do you understand by uh item potents uh in ansible so okay um it's a scenario where if it has been done before it doesn't do it again um, that's the simplest part. If uh, that process has been done, has been created before, uh, has been done before, when it gets to that stage, it doesn't rerun it, it ignores that, um, that stop since that's a record that this has been done before and moves to the next uh, uh, process. Okay, and why is it important in configuration management? Um, to avoid, um, to use the time, basically, it also works around time and misconfiguration, basically. It has been done before. Um, if you do it again, it may affect some conversions and the sets, and also it saves time because what has been done before shouldn't be repeated. Because, um, usually, um, don't repeat yourself. Yeah, the drive method. Okay, yeah. So basically, Ansible is designed to be iron impotent. Um, I mean, it means that applying the same configuration multiple times produces the same result. Okay. Yes. If if we are doing it for the first time, it will produce the same result. If we are doing it for the hundredth time, it will produce the same result. This will ensure that running Ansible playbooks multiple times does not result into unintended changes and that's very important. Why is it crucial? Because in configuration management to prevent unnecessary modifications and maintain a consistent state and a reliable server state. So that's why it's important. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, uh, consider a scenario. 
in which you need to configure a new web server cluster on AWS. Okay. And you have to do it using Ansible playbooks. How can you ensure consistent repeatable uh, configuration across multiple instances? Um, I think every table is still around um, creating the um, the playbook kind of um, getting access to those EC2 instances. Um, in this scenario, uh, you have access to the PIM key. You use that to authenticate with the username um, authenticates. Run your playbook against those EC2 um, instances, and um, it's like you said in the in the potency. Um, the voice repeating yourself um basically that's the scenario uh, that comes to my head um see there are multiple ways to do it okay first of all you have to use yaml files you can uh, define your server configuration in yaml files organized by a role or a function why is it necessary because it will provide a clear and modular structure for managing your playbooks then you can utilize uh, conditionals or you can utilize variables you can use these variables to store common configuration files and define conditionals to handle different environment or deployment scenario. Okay. There is something known as inventory group. You can use that. And then you can use modular playbooks. Uh, you can break down your uh, playbooks into smaller reusable modules that focus on specific task. This will promote yeah. the code reuse just like we do it in Terraform or something. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's pretty much about it. Okay. So let's say, um, you accidentally deploy a faulty Ansible playbook that disrupts the production servers. How you can quickly roll back the changes and minimize downtime? Uh, I've forgotten that part, but um, there's a feature for rollback. Ansible, but I can't uh, remember the process, but I know there's a feature for rollback. Um, feature. Uh, what exactly is the feature? Uh, um, I think, yeah, I... No, no, I don't want you to roll back uh right now okay if you do not know that's fine but how can you minimize the downtime um except if you say you uh, you deploy sequential uh, in sequence um if there is um, a cluster of servers um some fleet of servers in a cluster um deployments are done one after the other uh, when one is done, like uh, you mentioned the conditional parts, when one is done um, and it confirms, you, you check it's up, you can also check uh, there's, a, um, there's, there's a play to check um, liveliness of your of, of that instance. If it's up, then you move to running the play on another um, instance so you get the last instance there, basically. Okay. See, uh... As a first hand incidents reporting, you can always identify the faulty playbook first. You can use Ansible history commands to pinpoint the specific playbook and version that caused this issue. Then you can develop a rollback playbook. You can create a new playbook uh, specifically designed to reverse the changes made by faulty playbook. Okay. This should address the configuration issues while minimizing additional disruption. Then you can test that rollback playbook, which you just created uh, in the testing environment, and then you can deploy the rollback playbook. That's that's one of the ways of uh, doing it. Okay. Okay. So you have mentioned in your profile something known as directory service. What exactly is this directory service? Uh, active directory service. Um, okay. So, so what exactly so, did you do with directory service? Yeah. Um, integration, uh, but more for around uh, management, user management, server management. Both, uh, both Linux server management both, uh, and Windows server management and also user access to um, an environment, our environment. Um, there was an integration with Azure Directory um, to, to basically work with um, 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 what is it called? NAV, NAV, NAV um, a finance, uh, Microsoft tool for finance related works, yes. Was around. Um, I use that for uh, server management, um, user management, so uh, to, to, to access their lab laptops and, and some specific sites, specific servers, to run some specific level of um, commands, giving these privileges and I like. Okay, okay. Um, so let's say you need to manage user access and authentication for your application across multiple AWS account. Okay. 
how can you achieve centralized identity management with directory service directory service um, I think you need to integrate that um, um, you can increase integrate with uh, I think a cognito um, AWS and actually uh, uh, Microsoft uh, managed um, um, uh, active virtual service um, the simple there's Microsoft there's an, uh, the managed part basically can integrate it with the uh, problem to I think to, to, to manage um, that across multiple applications um see I had the same situation in my project um, I'll tell you my approach okay first of all you can implement AWS management Microsoft AD okay this service will uh, this service will provide you fully managed active directory domain in the cloud this will allow you to leverage familiar windows authentication mechanism for your application okay then you can utilize uh, aws sso as well uh, you can integrate sso with your single sign on uh, with your directory service to enable seamless one click across various aws application uh, and third party tools for authorized tools you can leverage uh, iam uh, user groups as well and you can also implement multi-factor authentication okay that's that's another way of doing it okay okay um so let's say you have encountered uh, unexpected authentication issues for users accessing application through your directory service how can you troubleshoot the problem um so the service Um, for for Windows, uh, for for I I um, this passport. Um, I what is this passport? I I can't remember, but basically uh, there's a part on the Windows machine where I can go to. I can't remember if um, is this service. I can't recall. Or basically, I can check for audit audit logs and um, um, issues that are faced with the um, AD because yeah, the AD is a Windows machine um i check from the audit logs and see some of the errors that comes comes with it yeah uh yes basically um i've not actually faced that so i can't give you a detailed explanation on the process that, that i need to take okay okay um see first of all you need to review uh, directory service logs okay you have to analyze the logs for any errors or suspicious activity related to user authentication attempts. It will always log that. Then you can verify the user credentials. Uh, need to confirm that users are entering the correct username and password and ensure their accounts are active and not locked. Okay. Then you can check the IAM policies. You can review the IAM policies associated with the application and user groups to ensure the necessary permissions, whether they are granted for appropriate access or not. Uh, then you can test the user access from different devices. That's that's one of your way of doing it. Okay. Um, have you worked on Kubernetes, Elastic Kubernetes service? Um, yes. Yes. Okay. So can you explain me like what exactly was happening in your project with related to EKS? Um, deployed um, applications to EKS, uh, IoT um, applications. Um, on ETS, more of ARM deployments and some are stateful sets. Um, um, some set of um, jobs that needs to be run, some com, com jobs. But basically, it's, um, um, it's around uh, the management of our uh, containerized applications, deployments, um, and um, support. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about a scenario. Uh, you want to deploy a containerized application on EKS with high availability and automatic scaling. How can you achieve this? Um, um, you either use depending on your um, architecture, basically. Um, you set the deployments um, and you also, um, you also put um, 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 you said so most people do is port disruption budgets. Basically, this, you set the minimum ports that should be available for that deployment and the maximum port, port that should be available for that deployment. Um, some also do so, uh, horizontal port scaling or vertical port scaling. Most of the time, horizontal port scaling is uh, variable for availability against um, vertical port scaling because um, horizontal gives you um, additional ports to uh, the existing ports that you have for. Uh, vertical tends to scale up um, 
size okay see so, uh, first of all you can utilize the uh, deployment and replica set resources you can uh, define a deployment resource for your application which automatically manages replica sets uh, this will ensure specified number of pods are always running you can also use hpa a uh, horizontal pod auto scaler configure it uh, to automatically scale your application based on cpu or memory usage metrics this will ensure that sufficient resources for your application during peak loads you can leverage load balancer as well okay this is very important that you have to implement health checks why uh, i think you also told about this this, uh, this will define the liveliness and readiness probes uh, for your containers to automatically restart unhealthy pods okay or just remove them from the service if they failed the health checks that's that's how it works okay okay um let's say you experience network connectivity issues between your eks pods and external database okay how can you troubleshoot the problem uh, eks pods and your data external database um yes your service um your uh, your stateful sets or your deployments or your port needs um has to have a service at that time um, uh, um with your service you 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 have um, access to that port and that port basically can do the um as screeners calls to your database or your ports and also um simulation network um it's also part comes part of network secu um, security if um, a spe this specific port is port is not allowed um that might might affect your connection to your database um yeah yes okay see first of all you can always verify the pod network configuration okay you need to make sure that your pods are correcting are using the correct vpc and security groups this will allow them to communicate with the database instance that's the first thing you secondly check the network connectivity uh, you can use uh, ping or nc from within your pods to directly test connectivity with the database server whether it's able to connect to the database server or not okay uh, then you can check the firewalls uh, specifically data database firewall rules check if any firewall rules on the database instance are blocking access from your eks pod at the end you can always use uh, i think vpc flow logs is a thing uh, you can use that that's that's how yeah. it works okay um so what was the recent problem that you have uh, resolved with respect to kubernetes or eks um yeah the, the recent uh, was around the um, tcp and udp protocol um in my environment uh, we use um, istio for service service uh, what do you use istio 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 Achha. service istio, istio, istio service istio. okay um service to service communication more around internal communications why we use the um, uh, in network load balancer for external um, communications or yeah both out, outside uh, and the recent was uh, trying to um um create an endpoint using this tool um seeing if um, um udp can work on it but unfortunately um it doesn't support udp so it's basically um creating using an nginx proxy um alongside the uh in, in, in ingress sorry alongside the network load balancer to allow calls to the udp end using the ports that was set and um setting up um, the endpoint for the internal um, communications or using istio istio service image for for for, for the istio call so okay 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 so you have mentioned fargate as well um so what exactly you were doing with fargate in your project yeah um also for hosting containerized applications um because of um Man, um, less um, infrastructure managing overhead. Um, Fargate was um, used for deploying our microservice applications. Um, that was at Carbon. Um, yes, for my, uh, both front and uh, more around the APIs. Um, and so managing any modules uh, was deployed. So managing any applications kind of uh, deployed on Fargate. Um, or basically, it's more around deployment of uh, backend applications with Java, Python, and .NET. I'm sorry, uh, no GS, no .NET, no GS. 
what's the you know, dot net c sharp or some kubernetes okay so let's say you are migrating your uh, existing ecs task to fargate from uh, sorry for serverless container execution how can you ensure a smooth transition without downtime sorry um, can you hear me again you are migrating your existing ecs tasks to fargate for serverless container execution how would you ensure a smooth transition without downtime um what is this stuff called do um sorry i'm trying to recall um the group there's uh, there's a part in this yes um called um protein Mm, it's a group, basically. It's, uh, it's task group. Uh, for, um, I don't know why it's. Uh, I can't remember right now. But um, when you set up your 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 cluster, uh, when you set up your Fargate instance, um, especially when you are using, um, if you yeah, your ECS is working right, you have your Fargate set up, and you have it done. You use uh, the best is to use that. Uh, for me, what I've done is to use an uh, to route to use um, a load balancer as the uh, as the ingress behind the the, the group i've forgotten the actual name but you set um, that for ecs set that for fargate and um from the um, application end for example you can set a route set a route and put um in priority um, from zero if your ecs is, is um, higher priority to zero um then you change it to um you put your you said the 50 50 sorry in a percentage 50 50 um then after well, after testing then you can move your faggot that is now going to 100 and take down your ecs to zero but, um i'm trying to like i've forgotten basically um it's a group something like, i don't know i can't remember maybe it's, it's been a, because of it's been a while i've actually used the uh, Okay, so target groups, yeah, target group, yeah, that's what I was going to remember. So okay. um, you can route your 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 traffic to to, to your target groups. Um, your EC, ECS has its own target group for the former application. Fargate has its own target group. You put them behind the load balancer. Um, you can route traffic based on the uh, on the uh, on the percentage that you set for them. You can immediately move to hundred for for the Fargate and bring down your ECS to zero okay um you can start with updating the existing ecs task definition to use fargate launch type instead of ec2 instances uh that's one thing uh then you um, have uh, to sorry. sorry yeah continue no no please continue. Uh, the last time i tried uh maybe because of um I, you know uh, there's a version to it soon um there's a version um, i think the version one or something of this yes when i tried it it so um from my experience uh the version uh the version i think the latest version might work for it but the older version of ecs tax certain tax um doing immediately to fargates using the same tax for fargates field yeah that's why uh, i don't mind that the, 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 i know that part field i don't know if um there has been changes done to it using yeah, using an ecs ecs tax definition to spin up a fargate uh, uh tax I'll save you, sorry. Okay. Uh, see, why I asked this question because uh, this is something that I have followed closely um, in my previous uh, previous project. So, uh, as as first I told that you have to update your existing ECS task with definition to use Fargate launch type instead of EC2 instances. Uh, you have to implement a rolling uh, rolling updates after that. You can use a blue green deployment or rolling updates to gradually migrate your tasks to Fargate, which were on EC2. Okay, this will minimize the downtime by rolling out new Fargate tasks while keeping the existing EC2 task running until the migration is complete. Okay, uh, you have to monitor the container metrics as well uh, because sometimes what happens is you do not know how will they behave. Okay, yeah. so for memory utilization, CPU usage, because this will help you to identify any resource constraint or unexpected behavior on the Fargate platform. Okay. Also, you can use Fargate spot instance. Uh, you can uh, for cost saving opportunities if your application can tolerate interruptions during low demand periods. So yeah, that's pretty much about it. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So consider a scenario in which you have encountered unexpected memory constraint with your Fargate containers. 
and this has uh, been leading to performance issues how will trouble shoot and optimize the resource utilization um, for memory utilization um, most times i start from um, i start from the application level um, i think synchron developer and um, trying to um, know the minimum uh, more of the required um, memory that the application might need um, to perform efficiently. Um, with that, I can use that in my tax to, 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 to set the required uh, memory and um, um, based on future uh, um, scaling, then use um, an autoscaler, um, integrate a, a, an autoscaler with it. Okay, okay. Um, so you've worked on GCP as well? Um, yeah, it works. Yeah, on GCP. Look, how um, comfortable more, are you in GCP? Um, I have um, um, a little idea of the networking. Um, networking. I've done. Um, I've done something with the with the uh, database, the SQL instance. Uh, I've worked with the VM. I've worked a little bit with the uh, GKE. Um, um, I was more around working with um, BigQuery um, that was used um, with, from the uh, with, uh, with Python and um, the, 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 the machine learning guys tend to use BigQuery for, for running of their uh, queries, large jobs for, for their ETLs and the rest. Okay. What is APG in API GEE in GCP? Uh, I, can't, I can't recall. Okay. Um, okay. No problem. I'll I'll skip GCP then. Um, uh, you have worked on GitHub Actions as well, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. I used okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's say you want to automatically build and deploy your website every time you push new code to your GitHub repository. How you can achieve this? Um, you use um, GitHub, uh, GitHub Action. Um, the access of uh, YAML files, you can use um, um, that from the marketplace. You can build yours, uh, my dad using a workflow that you store somewhere, or you, um, you create your YAML file in the GitHub, uh, those GitHub um, folder directory, create a workflow. And in, those, in that part, you create your, your steps. Um, you can be on push. Um, to any of these uh, specific branch, which you can also mention in this in the, in the pipeline, um, it can be manual. Uh, of course, in the, the 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 commands used where you want to deploy, you um, you just click a button more around the continuous delivery process, and yes, you, you deploy your website. Okay, okay. Um... Let's say you encounter build failures in your GitHub Actions workflow. How can you debug and resolve the issue efficiently? Yeah, um, your workflow, um, yeah, um, during the deployment process, you can see the logs um, of uh, your build logs um, or deployment, let me say your pipeline logs um, in the action parts, um, in specific, um, um, in specific pipeline you want to run, you click on it, you, you click on the, specific, the actual step where it fails, you can see errors that might that that that, that basically occurred in it to make it more granular or visible in your pipeline steps. You can also put some write some little shape script to echo possible um, echo you maybe uh, uh, variables show confirm that it's correct and the rest. Okay, okay. Um, so you've worked on code build as well, right? Amazon code build. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, let's say um, you need to build and test your mobile application for both iOS and Android using code build. How can you achieve this within a single build project? <laughs> I don't ask. I basically I code build um, knowledge is around for me. It's around building containers, building what nine images and deployment um, for the um, iOS and the rest. I've actually not done anything on that. Um, I used um, um, the Bitrise. Um, there's a different tool for building um, um, iOS 
Android application, so I won't be able to answer that um, question because I kind of have, I have, I have little idea about uh, using that to, to deploy mobile applications. Okay, I'll help you out. Uh, so you can utilize multiple build phases. So we have a concept of multiple field build phases in that you can define multiple phases within your code build project. Each one of them would be tailored to a specific platform, either iOS or Android. Okay. You can configure different commands and script for each phase to build and test your app for the respective platform. Okay. Uh, we have environment variables as well. You can use them to specify platform specific settings like SDK path build parameter or testing tools within your uh, build script. Uh, you can use conditional steps. You can utilize uh, container images. Uh, they consider for container images. They can you can consider utilizing pre built Docker images containing the development tools and libraries required for each platform uh, within your code build project. Okay. Uh, hmm. Yeah, this this you can do. Okay. Okay. I get a part now. Okay. So uh, um, let's say your code build project takes too long to complete due to inefficient build scripts. How can you optimize the build process for faster execution? Um, it's uh, more around so using the artifacts. Um, so uh, for every build process, it's an artifact. Artifacts. Yeah, artifacts. So, how how um, would how would that help? Um, basically, um, the artifact kind of contain contains history of what has been built or what has been deployed. Um, you build on those artifacts, basically depending on yeah, if there's a problem, you build on those artifacts, and um, you, you you only new changes um, are, are, are kind of um, deployed or built, and um, yes, well, it's more around artifacts. I remember, yes, um, to, to 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 reduce your build time. Yeah. Okay. See, whenever there is a problem related to. Uh inefficient build scripts or anything that related to software world or any pro, uh, project you always go to logs in the same similarly in this case you have to analyze the build logs you can identify slow running commands or tasks within your build logs you can investigate if those steps can be optimized parallelized or cached to improve the execution time second is to minimize the dependencies review that your dependencies and identify unnecessary uh, unnecessary uh, libraries i guess or packages included in your project removing unused dependency can significantly uh, reduce the build time okay then you can utilize caching mechanism so you can implement code build caching to store build outputs uh, which you call artifacts and dependencies from previous runs this will eliminate the need to re-download or rebuild unchanged components so if there is a component that is already built you don't have to rebuild it or have to change this will speed up the process of subsequent builds okay and uh, we have, I think, leverage, you can leverage uh, code build profiling. Uh, it basically tools to analyze your build uh, process and identifying potential bottlenecks or inefficient resource utilization. Okay. That's pretty much about it. Okay. Um, what kind of projects you have worked on uh, in the recent past? Uh, um... Um, around the, with the latest project I worked on is setting up um, a case environment using Terraform, um, of setting up um, Argo CD, um, um, the load balancer using a network load balancer with the main rest. Um, also, integrating it with um, GFrog for um, where I store the M charts. Um, for, for, for deploying applications, um, using their form to, to, be, to, to deploy other services on AWS, um, from the network to database, to Redis, um, to transit gateway for the network. And basically, I would say um, um, I use their form to deploy the tests. Um, the dev, the QA, the staging environment, actually sending them into um, using different um, subnet side of group um, um, and um, in different region. Also, um, okay. yes, also um, from GitHub, yeah, I use Terraform to, to, to GitHub, yeah, um, use Terraform to provision some of the, the, the services in terms of teams, repository, um, the branching policies, strategy, and the rest. Okay. Consider a scenario in which um, 
you are the only guy uh, who is in a devops team okay and there is an application yeah. uh, of whose front end is written in react and the back end is written in c sharp okay. have you ever worked on c sharp based code okay. or java based code yeah yeah for one c sharp c sharp based code okay so th- this application the front end is in react and the uh, back end yeah. is in c sharp okay how would you create the pipelines so that uh, things remains isolated do not touch each other and gets deployed on uh, anywhere like if you want to deploy on any app service app service is also fine if you want to deploy it on any uh, vm or any uh, eks or any cluster that would be fine so how would you design this uh, architecture i solution uh, um for me um there are different ways to design um i can use aws amplify to de- to deploy the front end and amplify um, what is use, amplify um, amplify is um, a aws service that can use to deploy both web and the mobile apps on okay. aws aws amplify yeah okay um i can use that to deploy the front end and use um um the um kubernetes to deploy the back end and the um, authentication will be made through um authentication tokens or uh, yeah or api keys that if that might be um and also um with github action um, i can write a workflow um and add um in the repository for the front end um do a workflow call um for the front end, for the front end it deploys to um it can be a pod um, in this sense in aws inside the kubernetes cluster and also from the workflow call do that for the back end deploy that um, javascript java um, language or program that's in, in a different pod and um if they are internal since they, they're using on the same network they can do service service communication call um yeah that is um under architecture um i can also uh, deploy the web app on um on s3 use class from to front it um for um uh, for better availability and also have my backend on any uh, container service can be um fargate can be eks uh, as in the b and uh, they make um cost them so uh, the f- but front end may cost the backend using some authentication authentication methods it can be api key it can be an auth authentication key basically okay okay um so these two uh, things front end and back end would you create one pipeline for both of them or two different pipeline for both of them um for me um for from the github end i can have um, a workflow just one workflow um setting up from the from you can set up a template you can use that up we can set up a template where you're creating a new each repo uses that template that's the um already uh built in um pipeline workflow in it it's just just set some um um uh conditionals um, let's say for the front end you can put a value and set a condition for the front end and that's in pipeline just let us change and uh, for the back end set the condition now and they make a call to the workflow calls like the workflow bit of workflow they use that to build and deploy to their their previous environments okay okay yeah i think i'm done